Buongiorno. Mi sentite? Sì, buongiorno. Buongiorno ragazzi. Buongiorno, Bruce. Ciao Fulvio. Buongiorno. Eh, manca qualcuno dei vostri? Mi sembra di no. Ci sia Alessio, Gabriele, Stefano. Manca qualcuno? Sì, sì, va, bene. va bene Fulvio puoi partire grazie intanto grazie grazie a te me, mi, mi metto in modalità inglese quindi eh, per, per iniziare la lezione adesso condivido lo schermo un secondo <coughs> Vedete lo schermo? Sì. Perfetto. Allora, passo in modalità schermo pieno. Ok, good morning. And... Uh, all right. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, here is lecture two. Uh, just as a brief recap, uh from uh, yesterday lecture uh what we had is a, a general classification of plasmas introducing the fundamental clock concept including uh, the by length and then we discuss why uh, collisions binary collisions between charged particles are important and in fact we did uh, demonstrate that uh, they enter into the collision of slowing down and the concept of plasma resistivity. And then we went more into uh, some applied technological implication side of the fusion reactor scheme, uh, speaking about the power balance and the laws and criterion, identifying what is the optimal ignition temperature today. Uh, we will go uh, even more into details of the various terms into the power balance equation. And we will look into the uh, time dependent part and speak about the main heat signal loss terms. And uh, uh, by doing that, we'll introduce the scaling laws and the energy confinement time, speak about tokamaks and stellarators, our reference configurations. And finally, have a brief introduction about the inertial confinement fusion. So let me uh, very quickly go back to a uh, uh, lecture yesterday. <clears throat> so, what we can do is we, we can reconsider the power balance of a fusion reactor uh, describing the evolution of the thermal energy content. So you see that now we have this time derivative on the left-hand side, which is uh, the derivative of the uh, uh, energy density content of the plasma. And T, again, uh, is uh, given in, uh, in energy units. So uh, N times T is uh, energy density. <clears throat> so on the right hand side, we have exactly what we were introducing yesterday, as you see, uh, uh, in terms of the uh, fusion power release, uh, again, assuming a 50-50 mixture of deuterium and tritium, both characterized by density n, and uh, this is the reason why there is n over 4, because n is the electron density or the plasma density, and so each deuterium and tritium has and divided by two densities. So this is the product of the two densities. Here is the fusion reactivity and the energy released by the alpha particle plus the additional heating. So these uh, first two terms on the right hand side are what we were uh, saying is the uh, uh, essentially the power input 
And on the right hand side, these are the loss terms characterized in terms of the energy confinement time. So uh, we will see later again uh, that the loss term is actually taking place through the two channels, the radiation losses and the losses because of, uh, of other processes like uh, fluctuation induced losses. So uh, we uh, already introduced this yesterday. So uh, if in this scheme uh, you unbalance the two terms, of course, we put more power in than uh, power lost, of course, the energy content of the plasma will increase. So how do we do this from a practical point of view in this equation? If we take uh, the additional heating, which is something that we control externally, and we increase it very, very slowly, as slowly as you wish. Essentially, what you can think of is that uh, the uh, various equilibria of the plasma are going through a sequence of quasi steady states, in which essentially what we have in the right hand side is essentially imbalance. So you can assume, as we do very often in thermodynamics, we assume that the system evolves, but evolves through states of near equilibrium. So in this equation, you see that this is very well known. We have discussed in extension what this is yesterday, and we saw that this depends only on density and temperature because sigma times V uh, can be uh, plotted as a function of the temperature. So this is very well known. Uh, the additional power input you also know very precisely. So the largest uncertainty in this equation is what is the behavior of tau e, the energy confinement time, as a function of the density and the temperature? So uh, let's try to understand a little more what's going on. So uh, as we said yesterday, uh, if we are at sufficiently low temperature, I mean, yesterday I was showing a much broader uh, uh, range of temperature. But for very, very low temperature, this curve tells what is the power produced by the alpha particle heating. Uh, this curve, which looks like a straight line, is almost like a straight line for low temperature, is the power loss because of Bremsstrahlung, or a power loss in general, but is dominated by the Bremsstrahlung. So uh, this point over here is the point over which the alpha particle eating takes over the power loss. That means at this point, what happens is that we don't need any more additional heating. If we want to drive uh, the system through increasing temperature in this region where the loss term is larger than the alpha particle heating. Uh, go back to this equation. So this is the loss term, okay? So, and here is the alpha particle heating. So if this term is larger than this, this should be decreasing. So we have to compensate by certain additional power. Okay, so the additional heating is here that we need in order to compensate uh, the fact that the power loss is in excess. And of course, it will be peaked somewhere here where the distance between these two curves is maximum. When the two curves cross each other, means that we don't need additional heating to further drive an increase in the temperature. So what we can ask is what are the contours in the density versus temperature plane of the additional power required to maintain uh, the uh, density and the temperature constant, okay? So uh, whatever we need to put inside in order to preserve the plasma in near equilibrium. So you see that these are the contours. I, I, I assume that all of you can read easily a contour plot, but the fact that these uh, curves are more uh, as further away uh, uh, in this region than in this region means that here the gradient is uh, uh, less, less severe. And actually you can recognize that in this region where my hand, virtual hand is going through, uh, there is a, a clear region where uh, here there must be an increase and here there must be a decrease because we come from zero and then we go down again. So this is a pass, is a saddle point. So this saddle point of course, is the point in which if we make a trajectory like this one, the power which is necessary to drive the system from uh, zero 
uh, temperature and zero density up to significant density and significant temperature. So towards the ignition condition, the power needed is minimized. So this uh, presence of this subtle point is called the Corday pass. It's very well known in, in fusion and provides you an optimal trajectory that you need to control, of course, externally by suitably uh, modulating the power input, uh, uh, the additional heating, in such a way that you do not waste uh, your uh, additional power in order to drive the system, for example, uphill through this. So this region you recognize is much more uh, difficult to achieve than this region here. And this region is much more performant in terms of the uh, fusion power. So uh, by doing this and looking at this type of diagrams, we can actually optimize the approach to uh, ignition. Now, once you have approach ignition, as we say here, uh, the question is that we go into the ignition condition when alpha particle heating exceeds the power loss. Then at that point, what we know is that uh, something takes place inside the plasma that needs to reorganize itself, right? Because essentially alpha particle heating will modify density and temperature to the point uh, that uh, they will be not stable. So this is not really a pleasant feature uh, of, a, of a fusion plasma or a, of a reactor plasma. So let's try to look at the equilibrium condition. This is the ignition condition. That means it's the power balance when we have put to zero the additional power. And let's try to look into the stability of this. So assume that we have a small change delta T of the operation temperature and try to understand whether this situation, which is uh, the equilibrium condition, is stable or unstable. So if we expand the power balance about the operation temperature, assuming that the density is fixed, of course, we have 3n ddt delta t, uh, which is essentially the variation of the rate of change of the internal energy because of this shift in the temperature. And then we have to take uh, the other terms. In the other terms will be this one, which of course will be n squared over four, the derivative of the reactivity in terms of delta t times delta t. And then we take a derivative of this other piece. Okay, there will be with a minus sign, obviously there will be a minus three n delta t over tau. And then we have to take the derivative of tau with respect to t. As I said before, this is actually where the, all the uncertainty comes because we don't really know about uh, how, what, what is the behavior of tau e versus uh, density and temperature. Actually, I will discuss this more in detail later, but this is actually what we can uh, derive quite easily. And uh, if we substitute at this point, the power balance inside, because we know that this quantity here can be expressed in terms of the reactivity, right? Because at the equilibrium where we are, this uh, equation needs to be satisfied. So if you take 3nt over tau and replace it by uh, diffusion reactivity, you can collect out here diffusion reactivity and you obtain in the square parentheses, these three terms are essentially the one that you see up here. So essentially everything that we need to know whether uh, ddt of the change in temperature decreases or increases, that means the stability of the ignition condition is all included in the behavior of the fusion reactivity and in the behavior of the uh, uh, energy confinement time with the temperature. Okay, so this square parenthesis, if this square parenthesis is positive, you readily recognize that this is a differential equation that has an exponential solution. That means the operation temperature grows exponentially. This means this is unstable, okay? So the stability condition will be given by the sign of this quantity here. Now, if we plot it, the condition for stability is that this derivative must be less than this quantity here, which is the condition that this square parenthesis is negative, okay? So stability condition is this one. And therefore we can plot it again in a, in a plane in which we plot this quantity, 
versus the temperature, because everything here depends on temperature, only on temperature. And uh, typically, the system will have a stability curve of this type. So uh, here we have the condition when uh, this object here uh, is uh, plotted. And therefore, over here in this region, we have that the system is unstable because this quantity will be violated. In this region where this quantity here is below this marginal curve, that is what we write over here, is stable instead, okay? So uh, what we have is regions in the operation plane where we know whether we do need or we do not need uh, feedback stability control in terms of guaranteeing that our reactor has a stable operation. So. Uh, the possibility of providing us a, a feedback is clear and needed, okay? So uh, uh, this is something that we need because as soon, sorry, as soon as we drive the system in this region, of course, we know that the alpha particle eating ra rapidly takes over. So what we need to do is some, something that as soon as we go above this point in temperature, we uh, can be restoring uh, the condition for stable operation. So one possibility, of course, uh, is uh, uh, having a feedback control in terms of the density, because you see that the fusion reactivity, as usual, what we were plotting yesterday, is depending on the density square. So if we make a small variation in the density that in the condition that we were looking at here is assumed to be constant, of course, we quench uh, this further uh, input and we can rapidly make uh, this negative, right? Because you see this depends on n squared. This only depends on n. So if we diminish the density of the plasma operation or the fuel, uh, then it's automatic that we can make this negative very quickly. Uh, and uh, of course, is uh, uh, somehow uh, intrinsic uh, the, uh, the fact that whenever we operate and we generate fusion reaction, another point is the accumulation of helium ash. So uh, when we go uh, through uh, reactions, of course, what we are producing inside the plasma is uh, alpha particles. Now, alpha particles don't participate into the fusion reaction. So uh, of course, in this very simple equation that uh, we are writing here, like this one, uh, what we have is that uh, the uh, mixture that is assumed is a 50% mixture of deuterium and tritium. As soon as you have the first fusion reaction, you will not have only deuterium and tritium inside your plasma, but also alpha particle. Now, alpha particle are important when they are produced because they provide the self-heating, the nuclear self-heating. In fact, either we do have this term here, the energy produced by the alpha particles, or we do not have the heating. However, once the particles have released their power to the background plasma, warming it up, so once the alpha particles are thermalized, so decreasing from the 3.5 MeV down to the temperature of the plasma, then they are not useful anymore. So they become like an impurity. And uh, you remember yesterday's lecture, uh, when <clears throat> we were basically saying that we cannot tolerate a too large level of impurity inside the plasma. So uh, they become impurity or ash. And of course, by controlling the removal of the helium ash is also a possibility of controlling the density of the fuel and therefore also the feedback stabilization. So uh, having spoken about how we achieve the ignition condition, how we can uh, make sure that the ignition condition is uh, maintained in a stable way inside the plasma. Let's speak about the main heating and loss terms inside the uh, power balance equation. <clears throat> so uh, a <clears throat> schematic representation of the plasma heating process, in addition, of course, uh, to the nuclear fusion self-heating, uh, which is something that we have been looking at in a great detail, you can go back to lecture one and also to what we just discussed, uh, is schematically given here. So this is a donut. 
Uh, this is the toroidal configuration scheme, like uh, the one of Tokamak. We will see this uh, more in detail later. And uh, we have to inject power from outside. So one way uh, anticipated yesterday when I was speaking about the plasma resistivity is through uh, electric current, because if an electric current is passing through the plasma, uh, it uh, provides uh, heating of the plasma itself because the plasma has a small resistivity, but not really zero. So there is a ohm dissipation or ohmic heating that provides a, a heating of the plasma by driving an electric current inside the plasma. Uh, we will see this in a moment, why this is typically not sufficient. So in addition to ohmic heating, uh, which is always present by the fact that there is a current and there is a plasma, we do have additional, so-called additional, not only external, but additional heating scheme. One possibility is through radio frequency wave heating. Uh, typically, the scheme is that you have a transmission line, an antenna interfacing with the plasma, and there are radio frequency waves that are launched inside the plasma. Why radio frequency? Because these are uh, waves that are uh, in uh, typically from uh, a few hundred, a uh, hundred megahertz up to gigahertz and even more, hundred gigahertz. So uh, these are the range of uh, radio frequency. That's why it is called radio frequency heating, depending on which a uh, resonant interaction. So you all have very familiar the concept of uh, your microwave oven at home. So microwave oven have operation frequency at 2.45 gigahertz. Now, why that frequency and not another frequency? Because that frequency matches the vibration frequency of uh, water molecules. So uh, every uh, thing that contains water uh, can resonate uh, with the frequency that you are injecting with the radio frequency. And therefore the power you are injecting in terms of radio frequency is transferred as a vibration energy of the water molecules. That's why you warm up your food. And uh, uh, in a very similar way, actually, uh, uh, the Similar resonances, even though not with water molecules that don't exist inside the plasma, but with other type of uh, resonances, it's uh, actually too, too much detail I would need to uh, introduce at this point. So I just tell you that there are proper resonances inside the plasma. And when you can match these resonances with your radio frequency injection, you can actually transfer the uh, electromagnetic energy that is inside the waves uh, to uh, various type of uh, uh, oscillating energy or vibration energy inside the plasma. And that is also providing a very viable tool to heat up the plasma. Uh, inside the DTT, for example, you have uh, very likely heard that uh, Infrascati, we are uh, in, the in, in, in the process of constructing uh, the diverter tokamak test facility which will be uh, operating in seven years from now or six years from now, hopefully. Uh, uh, one uh, uh, radio frequency that will be used is at the uh, ion cyclotron frequency because there is a cyclotron motion of the uh, ions, the thermal ions inside the plasma. And uh, uh, the typical frequency is in the order of 100 megahertz. Uh, another very efficient scheme is uh, doing the same with uh, electrons. So with the electron cyclotron frequency, but the frequency of course is larger because uh, the uh, electrons are typically, as uh, we said yesterday, uh, more than 1000 times lighter. And therefore the frequency, the cyclotron frequency goes up. And the uh, electron cyclotron resonance is also being used uh, for heating up uh, the plasma in DTT. So this is about the radio frequency heating. So in addition to this, there is the possibility of injecting uh, uh, neutral beams. Now, why do we want to inject neutral beams? Because if uh, uh, the uh, particles that are used are neutral, they can easily enter inside a region where there is a magnetic field and charged particles. And by the interaction, 
with the charged particles, we will see it later, uh, they can release energy to the plasma because uh, the energy by which uh, we inject uh, beams inside the plasma is larger than the thermal energy of the plasma itself. So these are the main heating scheme. So now let's uh, look into the details. The ohmic heating. So we know from lecture one that the resistivity of the plasma is given by this expression. Okay. So it's case like the temperature to the minus three Fs and uh, it's proportional to the Coulomb logarithm. The number of particles, lambda is the number of particles inside a device sphere is a large number. But the main point is that uh, this is automatically a very inefficient way of uh, heating up the plasma because of course you see that the, the hotter the plasma is, the less is uh, the resistivity. So the power density dissipated by the plasma currents due to the finite resistivity uh, is essentially given by this, the, the ohmic heating uh, over the volume, the power uh, over the volume is expressed by the product of the current density times the electric field and using the resistivities eta j square or e square over eta, okay? So uh, you obtain uh, something like this, uh, recognizing that uh, since there is a J square, it will be proportional to the current uh, uh, that is going through the plasma to the power two, uh, inversely proportional to the temperature and also proportional to uh, this effective Z. Uh, now, of course, if you uh, have more than one species of ions inside the plasma, what you have to replace here, this atomic uh, uh, number, this uh, charge number uh, uh, of the uh, plasma ions by a suitably uh, averaged uh, value of Z itself over clearly the density of charges. So if you use the density of the charges as a weight and you take a weighted average of Z over the density of charges, you obtain this, which is the effective Z that replaces the plasma uh, resistivity. So this is the reason why you obtain this uh, Z effective here. In addition to that, uh, in order to uh, write uh, the plasma volume, because here there is a representation of the plasma volume, we have that uh, the plasma volume has uh, to scale uh, with the dimension. Actually, there is another dimension here that is coming from the density. So it will be essentially the surface square uh, because there is J, right? It is uh, the current divided by the surface of the plasma square. And the uh, surface of the plasma will be proportional again to the radius, minor radius of the plasma square. Therefore it will be to the fourth power and directly proportional to the elongation of the plasma because the plasma doesn't have only a circular cross section but is more uh, of an ellipse. So if we have to put a practical formula, so this is something that you can actually use and is transferred into uh, MKS units. So if you want to calculate the megawatts per cubic meter that are produced by the ohmic heating, you can use this very handy formula. And uh, uh, this very handy formula works uh, very well assuming that the section of the plasma is nearly an ellipse. So if you want more fancy formulas, uh, taking into account that the plasma section is not truly speaking an ellipse, you can make better than this, but uh, at the zero order, you can very effectively use this formula. So if you want to annotate that on your prontuary of uh, uh, useful formula, uh, with this formula, you can calculate the power, uh, the ohmic power quite easily. So uh, the question again is because of these three to the minus three halves dependence is very questionable whether or not it is uh, sufficient to use ohmic heating uh, in order to achieve the temperature that is necessary for uh, uh, achieving ignition. So because of this, uh, as I said before, uh, there is the uh, radio frequency wave heating uh, and the neutral beam injection. So uh, these uh, actually mechanism are uh, something that I cannot treat in detail in this lecture. Uh, and uh, the reason 
is because of the interaction of radio frequency waves uh, are a quite complicated subject that deserves a number of lectures by itself. So I did, uh, I, I did not put uh, additional material for that. I think that perhaps you will have a special uh, lectures uh, for, uh, for this type of uh, uh, phenomenology. I will tell you though uh, uh, a few words about uh, more about the neutral beam injection. So what is the neutral beam, uh, uh, the neutral beam injection? As I said before, we need to take a beam, uh, uh, a neutral beam of particle. Neutral is necessary because otherwise the particle will not penetrate uh, the region where there is a strong magnetic field as inside the plasma. You remember, right, that yesterday we said that the confinement is very good across the direction of the magnetic field because the magnetic field basically anchors the individual particle to the individual field lines and they spiral motion with a very small radius, the Larmo radius, inside the region where there exists a magnetic field. Therefore, if we want to penetrate the region where there is a magnetic field, we have to do it with neutral particles, particles that do not bear charges. We want also that these particles are very energetic because of course, if you want to transfer energy, which is kinetic energy from neutral particles to a plasma that typically has temperature in the order of 10 of keV, you need to have larger energy of the beam than uh, energies in the order of a few 10 of keV. Uh, typically what we chosen for uh, uh, DTT, again, taking DTT, the machine that is being constructed in Frascati as a reference, we choose to inject a beam of particle at 500 keV. So the neutral beam uh, that we have to inject will have 500 kV in ether that is larger than uh, DTT, the beam will have an energy of one MeV. So uh, it's really high energy and of course much suprathermal energy. So what is the process? Typically we have a source of a gas and uh, the source of gas must be of the type of uh, uh, atoms you want to inject. Typically it could be deuterium, or tritium because we have to provide also nuclear fuel to the uh, plasma that is burning up continuously, both deuterium and tritium produce, producing helium ashes that we remove from the plasma. So it's also an issue of fueling here. So, uh, so we have a gas, either deuterium or tritium, and uh, we ionize this gas at the low energy. Now, after the uh, uh, gas is ionized, of course, it's easy to accelerate that because we have an acceleration grid. And usually we use this uh, uh, acceleration grid in which uh, we put uh, uh, all the energy we want inside uh, the accelerated particle. Now, the, the problem that we have at this point is exactly the inverse problem we had before. Before we had to ionize the particle. Now we have to take fast particles that are ionized and we want to re-neutralize them. And of course, this mechanism is quite difficult because is uh, when, when you have uh, ions uh, that are ionized and you want to make them neutral, uh, the charge exchange, uh, that, that is the name of the process uh, that we need to uh, put in practice is uh, not, not really extremely efficient. And this is one of the crucial steps actually of uh, a neutral beam injection, injector. Once uh, the particles are partly uh, uh, re-neutralized, uh, we have a deflection magnets because when these particles go to a deflection magnets, only the neutral particle goes straight, whereas the energetic particles that are not re-neutralized are deflected and there is an ion dump. And eventually the energetic particles go into here there is jet plasma, but of course it can be DTT or it can be ether. Now, why do we say that we use negative neutral beams? Because in the process of ionizing and re-neutralizing, 
uh, what uh, is easiest is the less uh, intuitive uh, way of doing the process because every one of us, uh, what we would do uh, uh, if we have a, a deuterium atom, for example, deuterium has uh, one neutron, one proton, and one electron, okay? It would be intuitively very easy to strip and actually cheaper to strip uh, the electron from the neutron and then of course accelerate something that has a positive charge because we have taken away one electron and then uh, having electrons here, reattaching electrons to the uh, deuterium atoms in this case. Now, uh, in this process, uh, what happens is that it is very cheap to take away electrons from deuterium at low energy, but it's very expensive to attach electrons uh, to uh, positive deuterons at high energy. Instead, if you take an ion source and you try to attach a further electron to a deuterium atom, so making the uh, deuterium negative, then accelerate it, you find out that at high energy, it's much cheaper to strip away an additional electron for, uh, from uh, a deuterium and much cheaper than it would be doing the other way. So uh, the best way is to uh, address the most difficult point problem at the low energy, that means dressing atoms, neutral atoms with an extra electron to make them charge, accelerate them, and then strip them. This is the easiest way. That's why when we speak about uh, beam injection, we distinguish between positive neutral beam, that means neutral beams that are made from a positive ion and which is then uh, uh, dressed by a particle, by an electron, versus negative beams. So when we first attach an electron to the ion, accelerate them and then strip them. So the easiest way, the most efficient to be the present technology is the acceleration of negative neutral beams. And this is what we will do in uh, BTT. <clears throat> so uh, having spoken about the uh, additional power uh, uh, schemes, let's speak about the loss terms. So uh, generally the losses are connected, as I said yesterday, either with the radiative processes or the losses due to the plasma transport. So, uh, of course, what we did in lecture one uh, is combining these two loss terms and uh, actually describe them through the introduction of the concept of the energy confinement time, which is actually what we also did today for calculating the stability of the ignition condition. So it is typical of uh, uh, using the uh, uh, this approach, uh, especially for the part of the transport uh, uh, losses, uh, because uh, let's say that uh, these losses due to the transport are largely dominated by fluctuation induced processes uh, on micro and macro scales. And it's quite difficult to have one single way of describing uh, all these processes. This is a variety of turbulence mechanism from the macroscopic to the microscopic turbulence. And so it is very efficient to maintain the description in terms of the energy confinement time for the uh, losses due to the uh, plasma transport. However, for the radiation losses, we know uh, very, very much the details of the processes. So what we can do, we can actually calculate very precisely the radiation losses. So, what, uh, uh, what is the origin of, of the radiation losses? So essentially, uh, they are all consequence of the fact that uh, one single charged particle, so again, uh, there is the electric charge uh, as a source of uh, all this type of phenomenology. Uh, uh, one uh, charged particle, when it is subject to acceleration, it emits power. Uh, in the non-relativistic limit, uh, the uh, uh, expression for the power emitted in terms of radiation, electromagnetic radiation by an accelerated particle is given by the Larmor equation. I give you the Larmor equation here. 
uh, I don't derive it. I think that you took uh, uh, the lectures in your uh, uh, ENN course. <clears throat> However, uh, that's not really uh, sufficient because uh, uh, the uh, necessary uh, generalization uh, for many uh, of the electron induced uh, losses for uh, radiation um, comes from the fact that uh, this acceleration term, of course, uh, brings inside uh, a inverse dependence on electron mass, right? Because uh, uh, the acceleration is not V dot, uh, sorry, the force acting on the system is, uh, is V dot, but is the force divided by the electron mass. Therefore, since electrons can be uh, quite strongly relativistic at the energies that we are uh, dealing with, because you remember that uh, the electron rest mass is 500 keV, roughly, is about. So we are speaking about MeV particles and MeV energies. So the electrons can be quite relativistic. So what we need to use generally is the generalization of the Larmor equation, which is given by the uh, linear Wittier potential. Again, I write it down for completeness in such a way that each of you who would be curious to look into the relativistic correction can take a look at that but you don't need. I think that for our purposes, knowing the Larmor equation is more than enough. So uh, classifying the radiation losses more in detail, uh, there are essentially three types of processes. There is the branch stratum. I mentioned it yesterday already, it is essentially due to the fact that uh, a particle is undergoing acceleration by the Coulomb collision. We uh, uh, dealt with very, very much in detail with the Coulomb collision yesterday. We even derived the Rutherford cross-section for uh, the Coulomb collision. And of course, it is all due to the fact that when a particle is entering, a charged particle is entering the device sphere, remember that the device sphere is the sphere inside which uh, the electric field of a single particle can be experienced by all the particles belonging to that sphere. Beyond, so further away uh, from a particle uh, than at the by length, the screening uh, of the device screening is so efficient that basically there is no uh, force visible outside the device sphere. So essentially what happens, you undergo a Coulomb collision Every time a particle enters into the device sphere of another particle, at that point, we know that that particle can go very close to the origin of that device sphere. And uh, uh, the process that deflects the particle causing acceleration is a Coulomb collision. And by doing, uh, going through this acceleration, the particle loses power. So not only is being scattered uh, or deflected, but it will be losing power. And this process is the branch strand. In addition to this, we have a magnetic field. And as I said yesterday, what happens is that in the presence of a magnetic field, the particles will move freely along the uh, field line, the magnetic field line, but in the perpendicular direction, they will be undergoing a spiral motion or a circular motion if you project the motion in the transverse plane with respect to the ambient magnetic field. This circular motion, of course, is also subject to acceleration. And because every circular motion is uniformly accelerated. And because of this, there will be another emission, which is not connected with the acceleration due to the Coulomb force, but acceleration due to the force exerted by the magnetic field. And this is the cyclotron emission. Finally, finally, there is another type of radiation, which is not necessarily connected with the acceleration of the particle, but is connected with the fact that inside the plasma, uh, what are present is also partially ionized impurity atoms and not only pure charges. So atoms, as you know, are characterized by different energy levels. And uh, so transition of electrons between different energy levels is also can be seen as an acceleration process, but basically we know that in this transition, what the particle can emit is radiation 
given corresponding uh, to exactly the energy difference between the atomic levels. So in this case, we have line radiation. However, sometimes uh, because of the various processes, including collisions and various other type of interactions, the uh, jump of the electron that is bound to an ion is not occurring between two different level of bound states inside the same atom, but it can be actually stripped away from the atom itself. In this case, of course, there is no uh, uh, quantum conditioning on the energy of the stripped electron. So essentially, when we do have that the stripped electron is uh, taken away and the opposite process, when a free electron is captured, is recombined into an atom, then of course the recombination radiation can be uh, continuous. So it's not discrete, it's not line radiation, but is a recombination radiation, which is very similar, but has a continuous spectrum. So let's see the branch trial more in detail. So what we have, of course, is again, V dot, is connected uh, uh, with the presence of the Coulomb collision. So Z is square over B. B is the distance of the closest approach, okay? Or let's say is the impact parameter. Uh, that's uh, the uh, acceleration at which uh, we have, because of the Rutherford cross-section, the acceleration uh, that, that is subject uh, to the uh, interaction between the two charged particles. So, if we calculate uh, the branch trial, that means we are summing up on all possible uh, 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 impact parameters uh, using the cross section of uh, 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 the particles that are inside uh, the uh, uh, circular rim of radius B. So 2 pi B delta B is the uh, circular section cross section. And we are assuming integrating over all the possible power lost by uh, the particle in this way, and the power is given by this radiation power with the Larmor equation, then what we obtain by this simple integral is this expression down here, uh, which again, I give you in watt per cubic uh, meters. And uh, I would like to draw your attention that the scaling here is with Z squared. Uh, that's why actually the branch strong has such a strong dependence on the charged state. And actually, if we have too high Z impurity, the loss uh, of power by branch strong would be dramatically big. And of course, it will be product of the, uh, since there are two particles, right? right there, there are the impinging particles and there are uh, the scattering particles. Scattering particles are ions and the impinging particles are typically electrons. And uh, this will be given by this expression here. It turns out that when you are summing up on all the possible energies, it will be scaling like the square root of the uh, temperature. Square root of the temperature will be proportional basically to the typical relative speed of this particle. Now, uh, because this is because the uh, one of the energy uh, to the three half scaling uh, uh, that you have inside uh, the uh, Rutherford cross-section, right? So <clears throat> again, this is a very efficient way of calculating the branch strong loss. Uh, the other process, as I said, is the cyclotron emission. Now here, uh, the calculation is a little more complicated. I mean, this can be done uh, using the Rutherford cross-section, as I said before, and uh, uh, it is uh, uh, a, a simple calculation for you to do if you wish to go into the detail. Uh, with the cyclotron emission, the, the problem is a little more complicated and implies actually taking into account the relativistic electron distribution function and also the absorption and re-emission of the cyclotron radiation by uh, the plasma and also uh, the reflection of the power by the surrounding wall is a, a multi emission and reabsorption process. So uh, if you take into account all of this, uh, I just want you to know that these processes exist. I don't want you to know how to calculate them, but uh, please take into account that 
cyclotron emission is a very complicated process involving uh, the material of the surrounding wall, reflections, multi reflection and absorption. And in this case, it will be scaling like B squared. Again, it scales like uh, the acceleration. The acceleration, of course, needs to be connected uh, with the magnetic field. If there is no magnetic field, of course, there will not be any acceleration. So it's scaling like B squared. It's scaling like the density, of course, of the uh, particles that are uh, creating the acceleration process. And it's proportional to the energy. But however, is not only proportional to the energy, you can write actually a perturbation expansion here, where if you express the electron temperature in kinetic electron volts, uh, you see that you have to expand is uh, in, in, uh, in a Taylor expansion. It's actually a perturbation expansion, this one. And uh, you can calculate as many terms as you wish, but this is a very handy formula, again, expressing in watts per cubic meter that you can use. Note, please, that unlike this thing, there is no scaling with Z, because of course here is the electron, which is essentially uh, emitting the cyclotron emission, but it's scaling with B squared, and the energy dependence is stronger than in this other case. So this will be coming dominant over this one. This one dominates at, at low temperature, this one dominates at large temperature and a high magnetic field. So uh, that's, that's uh, something that I want you to keep into account. Finally, there is the impurity radiation. And impurity radiation, again, I give you just the formula here. Uh, I don't take into the detailed discussion. The line radiation and the recombination radiation, of course, they will scale uh, with the atomic number. And they will depend, of course, on the temperature. And uh, again, they will be always depending on the product of the ion and the electron density, similarly to what you have here. And the density are given in meter to the minus three. So uh, here is a plot that tells you versus the temperature, what is the sum of these two pieces versus the temperature. Uh, you see that the dependence on the various elements uh, varies, all right? So uh, you see also that on top of this, there are fluctuations. So uh, these expressions are approximations that don't take into account these various details. Uh, this depends on the atomic processes. And if you wish, there are people that know how to compute them. The important point for you to know is that for each of the various species, so oxygen, silicon, uh, iron, molybdenum, and tungsten, uh, there are different curves. Now, tungsten is very, very important. Of course, mo molybdenum also, oxygen also, because it's uh, uh, part of the constituents when you do the pumping, but typically in uh, conditions that are relevant for uh, diffusion technology uh, is molybdenum because it en enters into a number of steel, and uh, tungsten because is the element that is very often used for the plasma facing component. And you will be expert of this after, after the end of your course. And you uh, will, will actually tell me a little more about uh, all these details. So <clears throat> at this point, I think that we are just in time for a break because we uh, shift the, 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 uh, the topic to uh, the various type of energy confinement time. So let's take 10 minutes break is uh, 27. So at 37, 11, 37, let's be back. 10 minutes break. Okay. okay. Professore, scusi. Sì? Volevo chiedere, è possibile fare una domanda sulla lezione di ieri? Certo, ovviamente. 
diciamo è più una curiosità forse con una domanda in sé per sé ehm, quando avevamo parlato della temperatura di eh, iniezione no? Sì. Di, sì. e si parlava del fatto che... di... sì. Sì, sì esatto e si parlava del fatto che mh, ehm, più il gas fosse comunque impuro più questa temperatura andava ad aumentare quindi comunque eh, a scapito dell'obiettivo ehm, questa impurità del, del gas sotto, che, sotto, sotto quale forma si manifesta insomma perché comunque durante la combustione abbiamo come dicevamo le ceneri di elio però in sé per sé il gas stesso che impurità e come possiamo comunque magari mh, fare una sorta di clean up del gas dunque eh, belle domande tutte quante eh... Allora, eh, rispondendo in breve, eh, le impurezze entrano dentro nel plasma perché ovviamente il plasma eh, è materialmente a contatto con, eh, con le pareti. E ci sono svariati metodi per controllare il, il tipo di, di eh, particelle che entrano nel plasma, che ovviamente sono tutte le particelle che possono far parte delle pareti materiali di un sistema complesso come un tokamak, quindi... Eh, ora, nel vostro caso specifico, soprattutto tenendo conto dell'expertise del, dell eh, del professor Calabro, eh, voi vi occuperete eh, del, del divertore. No? Il divertore che cos'è? Eh, alla fine il divertore è eh, una regione eh, dove il plasma viene portato a contatto con le pareti materiali del sistema in modo controllato affinché attraverso meccanismi di pompaggio, di controllo della geometria magnetica che c'è al di fuori eh, di un punto a X, cioè il, le, le superfici magnetiche che racchiudono il plasma non sono tutte chiuse su se stesse, alcune sono aperte, no? e le linee di campo vengono appunto fatte confluire nella zona del divertore attraverso tutta una serie di controlli che sono sia topologici, eh, cioè della struttura del campo magnetico, sia spaziale che... Eh, eh, diciamo dal punto di vista del, della geometria della loro eh, diciamo connessione con le, le piastre le pareti materiali appunto del sistema sia da quel punto di vista che dal punto di vista eh, poi della, costitu della costituzione dell'elemento stesso eh, della materia stessa con cui sono fatte queste, queste pareti si controlla appunto come il plasma viene a contatto con le pareti materiali quindi anche quali sono le particelle di materia ionizzate a quel punto o parzialmente ionizzate che entrano a contatto con il plasma e quindi possono penetrare all'interno del core. Non a caso una delle cose che vi facevo vedere prima sono, sono le curve di, emiss di emissione per radiazione del tungsteno che è uno dei materiali che è più utilizzato nelle nelle componenti che si affacciano sul, fla sul plasma in un, in un reattore. Quindi eh, così entrano le, le, le impurezze all'interno del plasma, ce ne sono di svariato tipo a seconda di quelli che sono i materiali che vengono utilizzati, perché purtroppo non sono soltanto ceneri di elio, deuterio e trizio che ci sono all'interno del plasma. Non so se ho risposto alla sua domanda, poi possiamo entrare più nel dettaglio, ma sicuramente il professor Calabro le può eh, fare lezioni intere riguardo questi punti. No, no, certo, no, sì. Eh, mh, sì, no, la domanda è stata esaustiva, diciamo, perché io comunque eh, cioè non avevo capito che comunque impu queste impurità derivavano appunto dal, eh, dal funzionamento, insomma, dall'interno del, del plasma del tokamak, pensavo fosse già un'impurità a monte de, di quello che io andavo a inserire, del gas ionizzato che andavo a inserire. Eh, sì, cioè, anche questo che sta toccando lei è un, un, altro, argomento, un altro argomento importante che eh, credo tratterete comunque eh, più in là eh, durante il vostro corso, eh, perché mi risulta che studierete proprio come, come avviene il processo di trasporto all'interno di una regione eh, che è tutta intorno al plasma, cioè 
il problema di come si scarica la potenza eh, sulla... Sì, 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 eh? sì, sì stavo, infatti ho risposto sulla chat, ci avremo Marco Wischmeier e Sebastian Bredinski anche presenti nel corso, quindi... Perfetto, allora... Sarà, loro sono gli bene. Benissimo, loro sono degli esperti di questa, di questa materia. Eh, a volte, diciamo, eh, per evitare che eh, le pareti del plasma arrivino alle condizioni di, da di danneggiamento dovuti agli, eff agli effetti eccessivi di flussi di potenza sulle pareti stesse, si cerca di aumentare le perdite per radiazioni non dentro nel plasma, nel core, ma in una regione periferica. Cioè, paradossalmente, la perdita per radiazione è... Eh, una cosa che dobbiamo temere nella regione interna del plasma, mentre vorremmo che una volta raggiunta la parte esterna del plasma, eh, dove dobbiamo smaltirla la potenza, tutta la potenza, se potessimo, la faremo uscire in forma di radiazione perché è spalmata in, molto, in modo molto più uniforme. Comunque vedrete questi problemi più in là. Va bene, grazie mille. Non voglio rubare ulteriore tempo. Ok, so uh, I think that we can uh, start the second part of the, le of, of the lecture. Scusami, Fulvio, che dobbiamo riavviare? Sì. Simone, vuoi riavviare? Ok. È okay, già, già in corso la registrazione. Ok, very good. So... Uh, we have uh, identified at, up to this point uh, the various channels of the uh, losses due to the radiation. Now let's uh, address uh, the uh, uh, other losses that are due to the uh, transport. So transport losses inside the plasma uh, is due basically uh, to two fundamental processes. One is uh, the so-called collisional transport, and the other one is the transport to, due to the fluctuations that uh, exist both on the micro scale and the macro scale. Macro scale means the scale of the system. The micro scale means the microscopic scales associated with the fact that Uh, the plasma is magnetized and typically refers to the uh, scale of the Larmor radius of this particle. So uh, just to give you a flavor of what the micro scale are and the macro scale are, macro scale can be meters, uh, several meters in, in the case of ITER because the machine is very big. Micro scale refers again in the case of ITER but also DTT. Uh, to the Larmor radius that for the thermal ions, for example, in DTT and ether will be in the order of uh, 10 to the minus three meters, one millimeters. So you can uh, realize right away that the range of length scale that are uh, connected with the fluctuations are extremely broad. So let's go back to the collision and transport. So collision and transport essentially is connected with the fact that Uh, whenever you do have a Coulomb collision, again, you see how important Coulomb collisions are. Uh, during a Coulomb collision, essentially there is exchange of momentum and energy between the particles. And this is actually what we computed very carefully. What does that mean? It means that uh, energy and momentum, both in the transverse direction with respect to the magnetic field and in the parallel direction can change. Uh, when this change, essentially what happens is that the particles can jump from one magnetic field line to nearby ones. And when they do this, since uh, the Coulomb collision is a statistical process, and uh, as we discovered yesterday, usually it's dominated the collision of uh, uh, friction and exchanges by many multiple collision. Uh, when this happens is a Uh, statistical processes that enters. And so when you have particles can jump from one field line to the nearby ones by uh, a statistically dominated transport, uh, a statistically dominated process, this is becoming a random walk. So a random walk is connected with diffusive transport. And because of this, 
collisional transport takes place. Now, it's possible, even though we will not treat these in this lecture, it's possible to calculate this diffusive transport very, very carefully. And it's possible to verify theoretical prediction experimentally with a very high level of precision, much beyond what is the uh, desirable accuracy. So there is no doubt that we have full control of the uh, collisional diffusion processes inside the plasma due to the Coulomb collision. Unfortunately, uh, what turns out to be the case is that since the plasma is very low collisionality uh, because of the dependence on the temperature, again, uh, collisionality goes down like the temperature to the three halves power. So because of the collisionality, which is very small, uh, the transport are dominated by the fluctuation, both on the micro and the micro scale. And uh, uh, up to today, uh, there is no uh, comprehensive and satisfactory theory that tells you exactly how to calculate the fluctuation induced transport. So while for the collisional transport, we have the theory, uh, for fluctuation induced transport, we don't. And uh, this is the reason why still to date, uh, we use uh, an empirical way to describe the uh, losses because of transport, not because we don't know anything about that, but because we need a, a practical, let's say empirical representation of the confinement time. Now, whenever you do have such an approach, an empirical representation, uh, what usually people do, uh, they, they try to obtain scaling laws. And scaling laws means that you try to obtain a representation of the quantity uh, that you are looking at, but in this case, the energy confinement time, as a function of powers of the various parameters that are involved in the, in the, in the plasma. In this case, it could be the temperature or other things. So <clears throat> essentially, uh, uh, the point is that uh, this process is OK. It's OK in the moment uh, you are trying to apply it uh, to very, uh, let's say, very well-defined operation regime. However, uh, it's impossible to find one single scaling law of general uh, validity that describes all the possible various regimes of operation of tokamak. So essentially what one, uh, uh, we, we have today is rather than one unique single scaling law, we have a patchwork of scaling law expressions uh, that define actually more or less a historical development in the type of experiments that have been done in the fusion, uh, starting from the early experiments in which uh, mostly the uh, plasmas were omically heated. A second uh, uh, range of scaling laws in which additionally heated plasmas uh, with the radio frequency or beams uh, were worked in what was called the low uh, confinement time mode. Uh, another one later on in which it was empirically found that it could be advantages in operating in certain type of uh, uh, plasmas that were operating in a higher confinement mode. And finally, more recently, even uh, more uh, improved confinement regimes in plasma have been discovered. And so for each of these operation regime, we have a scaling block. So let's start with the omically heated plasma. When we are at low density, uh, essentially what happens is that uh, the uh, energy confinement time is found to be scaling linearly uh, with the density itself and also with, to scale with the minor and major radii in this way. So you see that there is density behavior here and you see here a plot tau e versus the density and it's also advantageous to go uh, to higher dimensionality. Uh, the dimensionality, of course, of the system is uh, uh, quite intuitive because uh, if you have a very large system, uh, the ratio between the surface 
of the system and the volume is decreasing. And so if there are losses that go out of the boundary, uh, then uh, obviously the bigger the system is, uh, the more you confine inside the volume. So that's why uh, you typically obtain a scaling which is favorable with the system dimension. So as density is increased, essentially, uh, you have this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, magic behavior and you say, well, so let's go to sufficiently high density such that at a certain point, we will reach the uh, very good uh, value of tau that uh, will lead us to, uh, to the ignition condition. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Because uh, remember, this is all empirical, okay? So uh, I'm not trying to provide you an insights into why things are going this way. So these are experiments. So if you keep on pushing on the, uh, on the density, you find at a certain point that the uh, energy confinement time stops increasing, you see, like in this curve, okay? So, and essentially, <clears throat> Uh, 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 the linear scaling of uh, n uh, is lost and tau e is saturated. And uh, the saturation value is connected with the current of the plasma and is connected uh, with actually uh, the current density because it's connected with the current and the surface. So is in fact ratio between the current and the plasma surface, k a square that you see here is connected with the surface of the plasma, the section. So what really matters here is the current density. So when you reach to this value, uh, what you have, you saturate, you saturate out. However, uh, by controlling the density and the density, especially the density profile, uh, you can see that you can go back almost to a linear scaling, basically by controlling uh, the profile of the density. So you, you see here, for the first time that it doesn't only matter how much uh, the average quantities are, but the plasma profiles are also important. So not only the density profile, but the current density profile, and similarly will be for the temperature profile. So this is called, uh, when you do this by controlling the profile, is the improved ohmic confinement. And by the way, the machine in Frascati uh, the tokamak, the Frascati tokamak and the Frascati tokamak upgrade have contributed significantly to this type of research. Now, uh, as the time has passed, of course, technology has improved and, and this is on your side, okay? So you study fusion technology and uh, uh, this is where technology really helps. Uh, and, and so what happened is that the technology for radio frequency wave control and also for additional power input with the beams uh, that I need the, the neutral beams and the positive, and then later the negative neutral beam centered. And essentially, people found uh, that by putting additional power inside the plasma, uh, the things got better. And uh, uh, so, uh, uh, this, this plasma improved over this type of performance where only uh, the ohmic heating was put inside. However, uh, what happened is that. <clears throat> additional power put inside the plasma uh, was really giving you an advantage because, of course, the more power you put in the plasma, the better you go. However, uh, not all the time. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, Goldstone is one of the first people that look into the uh, scaling laws with, the, uh, with this additional heating, found out that still uh, you would uh, increase uh, uh, the thing with the uh, plasma current. Uh, still, you would increase uh, the uh, things by adding uh, uh, plasma elongation and the size of the system. However, putting more and more power fixed the other things. You had a decrease in the performance. Note that uh, this doesn't mean that if you take power out, uh, the, the confinement time will go up. It means that you need power in order to achieve a certain current and a certain temperature. But uh, if uh, uh, you put more, you gain on one side to reach this parameter, but you lose on the other side. This is the, the, the meaning of this. So this scaling laws actually was obtained before 
uh, large tokamax became operational. So you see from this uh, size scaling that if you are constructing a new machine and you can uh, spend more money and therefore constructing it bigger, uh, it's favorable. Uh, so uh, there was a time in which uh, by finding out this, people said, okay, let's go to bigger machine. And so uh, uh, they did it. <clears throat> and what they found out is that by constructing JET and by constructing TFTR that were in the 90s, the two biggest machine around uh, the world, one in the US, one in the UK, and uh, one is still operational, uh, JET, uh, the uh, confinement actually could be made more precise. And so by having uh, the bigger, bigger machine uh, constructed, essentially the people uh, that were still thinking in terms of a possible large machine like ITER at that point, they introduced the so-called ITER 89P scaling. Now, 89 remembers the year in which the uh, scaling was obtained. P stands for some type of classification inside uh, the various scalings that were produced around those times. But this was very popular. The ITER 89P scaling in which these various power coefficients were kind of uh, changed a little bit. It was introduced not only a little uh, variation in the scaling with the, the current, but also a little dependence of the magnetic field. And still uh, one had uh, uh, isotope scaling. So going to larger isotope uh, numbers could be favorable. And there was still uh, this uh, uh, unfavorable scaling with the, with the power. And this is actually what you obtain if you put the ETA 89P uh, scaling predicted by the scaling law and the experimental database. And you see a large number of machines here. I don't tell you all this number where, where uh, these, uh, these machines are. Uh, this is in, uh, this was in Japan. We commented about that yesterday. These and these were in uh, United States. Uh, this is in Japan. Uh, this is in UK, this is in, uh, Germ uh, this is in uh, uh, US, and this is in Germany. So <clears throat> uh, what people found uh, at that point that there was a big advantage, and actually this is very important for, uh, for your own uh, culture, because uh, not only the people got this favorable uh, uh, operation by going bigger and by putting more power inside, but they discovered that by changing the topology of the magnetic field, there could be a significant improvement. And this was found out in the ASDEC tokamak that is in Germany. So people uh, uh, realized that by going from this uh, configuration with only closed field lines, uh, that is called a limiter con configuration. Limiter is this structure here uh, uh, that is uh, put there as a material wall for both stability and also for uh, leaning the plasma over uh, this material structure. So you need to uh, uh, somehow identify a surface within the plasma has to see. And so this is a called uh, the limiter configuration. And in this configuration, actually, you can achieve the low confinement mode, still improved with respect to ohmic heating, but not so much improved. But if you change your topology and you introduce a, a flux surface in which you have a X point, that means the magnetic field doesn't anymore twist around the surfaces, but has only a toroidal component. So you go from closed magnetic flux surface to open magnetic flux surface in this region. By controlling uh, the existence of this X point, you can have a further increase. By the way, in this region, this is what people call diverter. Back then, when Aztecs was uh, discussed and introduced for the first time, this region was not closed as is in, in today's experiment. However, it was enough to find out that there was this H mode scaling in which with respect to the ether 89P, uh, another uh, scaling was proposed in which the power dependencies are like this. So with respect to this one, <clears throat> uh, you see that there is a, a more favorable scaling with the various parameters and especially a more favorable scaling in terms of the coefficients that you have, you have in front of you. 
Now, there is a stronger dependence, a dependence on magnetic field and the strongest dependence on the geometry. So this is really advantages. And uh, uh, what uh, was found is actually there was a little slightly worse scale, worse scaling with the power. Now, uh, uh, there was another uh, change that was noticed and uh, it was called the uh, uh, ITER uh, IPB98 uh, scaling. And this is introduced when the plasma edge is uh, affected by the so-called edge localized mode. So essentially what people realized is that in, around the edge of the plasma, when you enter the edge mode regime, the reason why the confinement improves is because all of a sudden there is a region nearby the plasma boundary where the gradients of the various quantity in the plasma, like the temperature and like the density have a sharp increase, okay? It's like a pedestal, the way it is called in practice. But the fact that there is such a pedestal and such a region with strong gradients is also uh, leading into the possibility of uh, destabilizing fluctuations. And these fluctuations are called the edge localized mode. And so essentially what are edge localized mode are a simple manifestation of the fact that the plasma doesn't want to uh, contain so efficiently uh, the further energy you are injecting. And uh, what the plasma tries to do is to release this energy uh, with filaments that get detached from the plasma. When these uh, type of modes are excited, then rather than using this type of scaling law, you use this other type of scaling law. All these scaling laws are all similar to the L mode scaling. In fact, if you look at them, they are very close to each other. So basically what one could say, okay, let me say that rather than having uh, all this type of different scaling laws, uh, let me introduce a factor, uh, which I call the H factor, that tells me what is the energy confinement time over the, edge, uh, the confinement time that I have for the L mode. And remember the L mode scaling was, sorry, was this one, okay? In ether 89P, that was the L mode scale. So if I introduce this factor H, this operation regime or this operation regime uh, tells you that the H factor is typically two. Uh, so it's a number uh, and uh, is generally reduced below two if these M's are excited. So finally, what happens, this is not the end of the story. I mean, research is going ahead and uh, especially the capability of controlling plasma profile, more or less similar to what happened, as I said before, uh, to what happened in the case of, uh, of the improved uh, omic confinement. So people worked uh, with different control on the plasma profile. So if you start controlling the current density profile, the plasma rotation, which is a further degree of freedom for uh, uh, the various scenario, Controlling the plasma impurity, we had a chat with some of you before the start of the second half of the lecture about controlling the plasma impurity and cho choosing properly the plasma facing components. So the wall material, including liquid metal, if you uh, are fencing thinking about that, it's possible to further improve uh, the confinement. Then these are uh, in the so-called improved confinement uh, plasma operation. And, and that's about it, about uh, the, the scaling laws. So now let's try to look more carefully into the various configurations that uh, are being presently used for this toroidal geometry. And I will speak in particular about tokamak and stellar A. So uh, the toroidal curvature uh, that remember from lecture one is what we introduce when we take a cylinder uh, that is very well confined in the perpendicular direction uh, because of the magnetic field and bend it into a donut shape uh, to avoid the end losses, okay? So uh, we need to put toroidal curvature to improve the confinement. However, it's not simply good. What happens is that if we take a donut and uh, we bend the magnetic field into the donut shape, you know that uh, rings of magnetic field because of the uh, uh, Biot-Savart law, 
the magnetic field goes down like one over r, the distance from the, from the geometric axis of the donut. And because of the gradients that there exist inside the magnetic field, there is a force acting on the particles that are moving along this magnetic field. And because of the force, what happens is that there is a drift. And the drift uh, caused by these forces essentially causes ions to move in one direction and electrons to move in the opposite direction. And you can check that quite easily, that this is the product of the existence of this force that comes inside because there is a one over r dependence from the axis of symmetry. So the magnetic field decays away. But now, if you separate ions and electrons, you will create an electric field that is pointing from top to, to bottom, uh, an electric field that is transverse to the magnetic field that goes toroidally. Now, you can also show that in a plasma, if there is an electric field and a magnetic field, there will be a velocity, displacement velocity of the plasma that goes like E cross B. And the E cross B will be essentially directed in the radial direction, uh, will be proportional to the value <coughs> of the uh, electric field that is caused by <coughs> Sorry about this. Just drink a little bit of water. <clears throat> so it's caused by this charge separation. So what is the rem remedy to this type of uh, situation, which apparently seems to be hopeless, is to put a toroidal plasma current. Now, why the toroidal plasma current uh, is capable to cure this? is because toroidal plasma current, as I said, uh, gives a twist of the magnetic field line, right? So essentially magnetic field line along which the particle move freely are connected from below to top. So now the magnetic field doesn't go in and out the board at this point. So not only in the toroidal direction, but twists around. So if uh, there is an accumulation of electron charge here, an ion charge here, the ions will be moving around. So ions will be taken from up to down and electrons from down to up. And this will cancel out the charge separation. And by doing this, what we do, we avoid this plasma displacement towards the outside. So, and this is actually the motivation why uh, by uh, creating a plasma current inside the plasma, one introduce, uh, introduces a twist inside the magnetic field line, which actually cause the system to be completely stable. So what is the schematic view of a tokamak? Not only we have all these coils that we saw yesterday in which uh, there is a plasma, a current going flowing through the plasma with the twisting magnetic field line, but we need other elements. We need other elements. For example, we need a transformer. Transformer is what is put inside the plasma in order to have a flux that is varying in time. And because of the Faraday's law, this will cause an electromagnetic, uh, uh, an electro, uh, 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 Anyway, will cause a parallel electric field in the, in the direction on the torus. And this will be pushing the electric current along the plasma and therefore causing, by the way, the ohmic heating. In addition to this, in order to control the position of the plasma, we also need uh, a vertical field coils because these coils will cause a vertical magnetic field and by uh, the controlling of the vertical magnetic field, we will also control the twists of this uh, colloidal field line because you see also from this picture that the twisting field line will not only go in the toroidal direction, but also in the vertical direction. So by adding on top of that with the vertical field coils, we will have a control on the plasma stability. So uh, how does uh, ITER look like? ITER is the big international thermonuclear experimental reactor in construction in Cadarache, France is in the southern part of uh, Provence. Actually, a very nice place for you to go near Aix-en-Provence, if you like. That will be 
uh, after COVID finishes, uh, a nice place to go for you to visit. And this is the way uh, uh, ITER looks like, and uh, is a quite uh, significant, amazing big machine, and is going to cost around 16 billion, 15, 16 billion euros. So tokamak is not on the, the only option. So uh, in a stellarator, uh, the beneficial effects of this twisting of the magnetic field line that I told you about is preserved uh, rather than by having a plasma current flowing through the plasma by twisting the coils around the plasma. So uh, if you twist the coils, of course, the plasma will look like that. And if you take a magnetic field line, you see that it twists naturally because of this geometry effect. It looks ugly, right? I mean, the, the coils look, look awful. Uh, so the cost you pay by doing this is losing the toroidal symmetry. Every time you lose a symmetry in a system, you lose something. So you have to be careful about that. However, the advantage you obtain and uh, is a big advantage is that you don't have plasma current anymore. Now, plasma current is a free energy source that can drive instability. So essentially, uh, what you have as a benefit is the improvement of the overall stability, but complexity in the construction. Uh, you look, this, this is a real tokamak, is Van der Stein 7X, has been constructed in Germany. And uh, you can see that uh, definitely the level of complexity of the system is uh, quite remarkable. So uh, uh, a, a brief recap, advantages of Stellarator with respect to tokamak. Uh, stationary plasma operation. So uh, by removing the transformer that serves to induce the plasma current, you have uh, stationary operation. So engineer, engineers usually like very much something that uh, is stationary, right? So you can uh, operate in steady state condition and you don't have to worry about conditions that are varying stresses and all those things. So, and there is no net plasma current. So essentially it's free of current driven instability. However, as I said, the disadvantage of the stellarator with respect to tokamax is the complex magnetic field coils. The curved coils lead to large forces and require also strong supporting structures. And it's very difficult to make compact devices just taking a look. So this is uh, what is on the table at the present time. And uh, in fact, this is the reason why ITER is a tokamak, is the reason why uh, DTT is a tokamak. However, uh, no one to the present moment can say that stellarators will not be the final option for the fusion reactor. We don't know, basically. So this is the conclusion of the uh, magnetic fusion part. Uh, what remains for me to do with you is uh, to give you a brief introduction about uh, the notion of inertia confinement fusion. And uh, this is for completeness because you have to be aware that uh, inertia confinement is also an option. Uh, actually, uh, inertia confinement is uh, the uh, approach to fusion that for the first time attempted uh, to reach ignition uh, with the uh, National Ignition Facility in the US, even though uh, it failed uh, because of the underestimation of a number of problems that I will discuss uh, briefly uh, in a few moments. So inertia confinement essentially relies on the dynamic compression of a DT fuel pellet obtained by high laser energy or uh, by heavy ion beam. So essentially you have a very, very small few millimeters uh, uh, target or pellet of D and T. And uh, there are impinging radiation or intense uh, energy beams uh, that basically compress this to the point in which the temperature by compression and the density are sufficient to approach ignition. So this is the fundamental concept. Doing this rather than using high magnetic fields in order to confine the plasma in suitable conditions. So uh, the extreme condition of inertial fusion are similar to what is found in stellar interior. This is 
the plot in terms of temperature and density that I already showed uh, a few days ago, uh, a few days ago, yesterday. And uh, so this is only part of that plot. Uh, so we, it is not as complete, but if we collocate magnetic fusion in this range, so uh, this dense, density in terms of gram per cubic centimeters, and here's the temperature. So you, you see is between 10 to the seven and 10 to the eight degrees. Uh, essentially what is the target for uh, the uh, inertial confinement fusion is in this region. Stellar interior is this one, okay? And the sun core, our sun is, is here. Stellar interior and our sun. Now, uh, what uh, uh, is, is not mystery uh, is that the reason why inertial confinement uh, has received so much attention, especially in the United States and also in France, uh, without a big international program sharing uh, the approach to research in this field is that this is also the range where they do make the uh, test of nuclear weapons. And uh, that is why most of this research is classified and why the two largest world facility, uh, the National Ignition Facility in the United States and the uh, Laser Mega Joule in France, in France have experimental activity that uh, are significantly taken up by a military test. And the reason is this one, and is also the reason why it's so easy for them to get funding for doing this type of uh, tests. So there are two different approaches to uh, compression in the inertial confinement fusion. Now, let me say that I will not almost not mention the beam driven uh, experiments. I said that using high energy beams is one of the option. It has been basically dropped because of the two large uh, asymmetries that uh, uh, you get uh, by doing that using beams. And uh, the symmetry problems is uh, extremely important for the uh, compression of the, of the fusion target. And if you are not symmetric by compressing the fusion target, you can realize by yourself that uh, by compressing a target in a non-symmetric fashion, what you obtain is uh, a reduced efficiency in spending all the power you are trying to use in order to compress your target. So the two type of approaches are the so-called indirect drive that uh, basically is consisting with a, a, a cavity, the so-called hole round, and uh, is, is, uh, is a name coming from, uh, from uh, German, uh, with two endpoints in which uh, a number of uh, laser beams are entering and they uh, impinging over the walls of this uh, region. And this is in the range of 10 millimeters. This is very small, it's a very small thing. And the system around is huge, okay? It's various meters. Uh, so uh, the radiation that is emitted from uh, the surrounding is isotropized and impinges on the target that you see here, and uh, eventually goes through the compression. Or you can do uh, put a target inside one central spot and have directly the laser beams impinging on the target. So clearly, by doing direct drive, you gain in terms of uh, not wasting uh, the power that you lose for heating up the walls and uh, uh, losses through the endpoints and so on and so forth. Of course, this loses has the disadvantage of losing uh, symmetry. This one, as I said, has losses, but has a much more uniform radiation pattern that then enters on top of the uh, surrounding of the target. And basically by blowing off uh, the ablator, which is uh, the part surrounding uh, uh, the actual DT gas core of this uh, DT pellet, 
uh, by rocket effect, uh, uh, so by conservation of the uh, uh, momentum, uh, pushes the particles inside, pushes the, the, the central sphere into smaller and smaller volume down to a compression factor that is uh, bringing it to down to a fraction of a millimeter. So something that goes uh, from uh, various millimeters, so in the order of two to three millimeters down to a fraction, 0 0.1 millimeters. So you can see that the compression factor is more than a factor of 10 in the linear dimension. So it's several thousands in terms of volume compression, okay? So inside, a hot spot is created in the order of 10 kV, is similar to the temperature that we have in magnetic fusion, but with a much higher density. So in the order of 200 to one kilo per cubic centimeter, okay? So the matter inside is very, very dense. And so one cubic millimeter can be in the order of one kilo, okay? So that's to give you the impression of this. So this is what, what is happening. And uh, uh, so again, the fuel is compressed by this rocket light go off. And uh, during uh, uh, the final part of the capsule implosion, the fuel core reaches essentially all the uh, characteristics satisfying the loss on criteria and eventually ignites. So uh, the thermonuclear burn at that point rapidly spreads throughout the compressed fuel uh, yielding many times the input energy. So as I said, uh, uh, this is being done experimentally at the National Ignition, Ignition Facility in Livermore uh, in, uh, in the United States and by the Lazar Megajoule. So uh, the break even reached uh, by the National Ignition Facility in 2014, you see this in this paper in Nature, is actually a big result. Break, break even is, uh, uh, is the condition that has been reached all, only by uh, equivalent uh, DT uh, fusion reaction in, uh, in Tokamax. It will be overcome by the Q equal 10 uh, type condition that will be the target of ITER, but only uh, in the future. So this break even reached by NIF, by, uh, 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 laser ignition uh, by, by uh, a laser confinement, okay? So it was uh, actually a failure because uh, they were sure they could reach ignition. Instead, they reached only break even. And the reason why they did this, this was a failure, even though a big achievement, but a failure with respect to the expected target is because of the lack of symmetry in the uh, scheme that they were using for the compression of the plant. And this loss of energy was actually uh, the problem. And in fact, uh, when the X-ray enhanced the implosion uh, symmetry, when you are using the indirect drive, uh, the hydrodynamic instability is what really uh, uh, kills the, uh, the, the, the experiment itself. So we have the laser energy into the whole round, then you have various types of losses, generation of low density plasma, scattering hot electrons, and then you generate the X-rays, and then you have uh, heating of the walls, and you have X-rays escaping to the uh, final end point, and then finally you have capsule compression. And you see by the dimension of these lasers that only 10 to 25% of the laser energy. So that's why actually people insisted in having the red drive. But then, as I said here, the hydrodynamic instability is what really kills the direct drive. And so people eventually ended up having this, even though this very, very uh, minimum efficiency is very, very hard to, uh, to tolerate. So people are proposing improved schemes, uh, but still uh, the main problem is ensuring the symmetry in the implosion because otherwise, the instability and the hydrodynamics instability that dominates this is the Riley Taylor instability. Uh, uh, despite this, uh, there are, uh, let's say, novel approaches uh, to the ignition that, that the 
uh, inertial confinement fusion uh, standard scheme. And there are two basically that I would like to mention. One is called the hotspot ignition and the other is uh, the so-called fast ignition. So what are the differences? So in the uh, uh, central hotspot ignition, basically uh, everything relies on the precise control of the implosion symmetry and the hydrodynamic instability. So essentially what happens is that uh, you are trying to uh, uh, enhance the symmetry by controlling a very, very short laser pulse and uh, reaching uh, uh, intensity in the laser light of 10 to the 15 watt per square centimeters. So you see that right away, uh, in order to enhance this compression factor and making the pulse extremely short, extremely short because in this way, you do not allow, give time to the hydromagnetic instability to achieve uh, 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 the level uh, that breaks the symmetry itself. So essentially by doing so, so quickly and so fast, you control uh, the problem of the hydrodynamic instability from the compression, but then you need to do this and you need a very, very uh, uh, short pulse. Now, what is the limitation of doing this? The limitation of doing this again is purely technological because Essentially, what happens is that the pulse cannot be really uh, such a high dense intensity and so uh, short duration because an extremely high intensity laser uh, can tend to have a very short pulse. However, uh, you, you, uh, when you try to do this, uh, uh, the, the pulse has uh, a small, but find it long tail or let's say long precursor. In, you, you cannot really make a step function in, in a, a laser pulse. And uh, it rises rapidly, but it rises rapidly on top of something that still has a finite amplitude. So they are struggling with that. So if people would invent perfect lasers in, uh, in which the pulse shape control is perfect, and the intensity might even be higher than this one, then this way to go will be easy because essentially you decouple the compression from the ignition dynamics. The other one is the fast ignition. So if you can uh, say, well, let me be fancy because I said, if you can make a higher uh, intensity pulse and very, very short, you can go for hot spot ignition. Let me even uh, uh, assume that uh, into science fiction, we can go up to 10 to the 20 watt per square centimeters. And rather than going to one nanosecond, we go to 10 picosecond pulse. And that's, that's really short, okay? So if you can do that, uh, you, it, you immediately see that uh, uh, what, uh, what you can do is rather than trying to compress the fuel, you can try to ignite only one little part of the target itself. And by this, then let the uh, ignition pulse prop propagate uh, throughout the target. So essentially fast ignition or uh, uh, the hotspot ignition rely on uh, the development of picosecond petavat uh, class laser. Uh, this concept were proposed actually a long time ago but were not by, by, by any far means possible. They were really uh, uh, thought to be science fiction. This is again, one place where uh, the uh, technology improvement can be a key. So making possible something that we know now, but by now is still not quite there. So the uh, approach to inertial confinement fusion could be the final answer if technology improved. But more or less, there are very similar conditions, again, uh, which is part of what you will be uh, taught during this course, that if some technology issues will be solved for magnetic fusion, then also fusion, magnetic fusion will be at hand. The important point to be kept in mind is that technology at this point can really be a big 
help for science because science has addressed the problem, the fundamental problem to a point where we do have a feeling that we can grasp uh, not all the elements, but at least those that we need in order to produce fusion energy in the lab, but technology can still uh, develop further and facilitate the approach to these problems even easier and making them really uh, at the reach of a hand. So uh, this is uh, about what's going on. And what I would like to add, if some of you is uh, more interested in what uh, Europe is doing, because of course I told you about the military effort that are being done in uh, the US and in France. France is doing that by itself, not as a European effort. Uh, there is an initiative called HYPER, High Power Laser Energy Research in Europe, uh, where there are various countries, various nations, almost all uh, those that are involved in the European Union that are pushing for applying these advanced class lasers to the energy research. So the shock ignition is uh, uh, another uh, element that uh, is, has been recently introduced. And this is, again, uh, based on the shaping uh, of the, uh, uh, the, uh, the pulse. Basically, this uh, wants to reduce the high implosion velocity of the central hotspot ignition, basically by tapering properly the, uh, the, in the, the, the main pulse followed by a fast, fast ignition. So there is a pre-pulse, and so you see this foot is something I was referring uh, before. So you have a laser power that has a foot, and actually this uh, foot here is what really uh, is, uh, is uh, becoming a problem, because if you don't control this uh, main initial pulse followed by the fast ignition pulse, uh, then this can have a big problem. So, the uh, essential point is here is having a pre-main uh, pulse in which essentially everything is taken to the right uh, condition for kicking uh, the imploding target in the right way, followed by a fast ignition pulse that eventually will do the rest of the job. So this is the end of the course. So today we are not as late as yesterday, fortunately. Uh, the only thing I would like to uh, suggest you as uh, exercise in preparation of uh, the possible exam, uh, the methodology will be discussed with, uh, uh, with Professor Calabro. We will see how to do it. Uh, what I would like you to do is to combine a little bit the, the notions I gave you yesterday and in today's lecture. For example, justify why the branch problem can be expressed in this way. And this is uh, just an exercise or application of the concept of the cross-section. And uh, I think for you is, uh, is just a matter of sitting down a little bit and try to uh, understand and combine uh, what is the meaning of, uh, of the cross-section uh, of, uh, of a certain process with uh, uh, the information that today, using the Larmor equation, uh, one could use and substitute inside here in order to calculate actually the, at least the scaling of the branch traveling. I don't expect you to calculate the detailed coefficient in the handy expressions I was providing. Uh, and the other thing that I would like you to know uh, and to show is that in a non-uniform magnetic field, uh, there is a force acting on the particle, which is called the mirror force, which is given by minus mu grad gradient of B. Uh, the minus sign means that of course it goes against the gradients and uh, uh, where mu is the magnetic moment. So uh, when you show this, of course, you will realize that uh, in the token concept, the presence of this uh, force will cause the charge separation uh, that eventually would yield <coughs> the separation of particle and then the drift motion caused by the E cross B traces. So if you understand that, then uh, it will be visually immediate for you to understand that by introducing current in token map, uh, uh, you can stabilize all this process and avoid that it, it, uh, it reveals in uh, an unfavorable 
configuration. And uh, I think that that's worth doing because tokamak are the reference uh, configurations. And so for you, uh, it will be easy to understand why we do need all this complexity in the tokamak configuration in order to ensure that tokamak can be operated safely and with a stable cluster. Okay, so uh, this is the end of the uh, two lectures. I hope uh, that you will take away uh, from this, not the various details, but the main concepts, and that uh, the various handy formula I provided could be of help for you in your application uh, when you will study your problem, your favorite problem. And uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Grazie, grazie Fulvio. Grazie Prego. mille. No, poi volevo eh, dire così, se poi volete scrivere al professor Zonco, volete farci domande, lui è sempre disponibile. L'email è fulvio.zonco.it, allora, lo trovate nelle slide. Se voi vi collegate a questo, avete le slide, eh, c'è il mio sito, dal mio sito potete contattarmi, mandarmi messaggi, trovare altro materiale se vi interessa. Eh, come diceva il professor Calabro, sono a vostra disposizione. Grazie mille, Fulvio. Poi ci sentiamo grazie. per le eh, domande. Eh. In Ciao bocca al lupo a tutti quanti voi per il vostro corso. Grazie. Grazie, grazie mille. Grazie. 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 Grazie